Hey guys, it's Max. In this video, we're gonna be talking about this beast of a machine, our 112 terabyte central video editing server with maximum speeds of up to 3,200 megabytes a second. Yes, you heard that right. And not only is our QNAP's maximum speed about 35% faster than the $20,000 Jellyfish by LumaForge, but once formatted, we also have nearly twice the storage, 100 terabytes compared to 58 terabytes. On top of that, we also have two Thunderbolt 3 ports, which no other brand offers. So I can just plug in most recent Macs or PCs and get a connection of up to 1,550 megabytes per second read, where a 10 gigabit ethernet gives you about 1,000 megabytes per second and only under you know most optimal situations. And with that, most computers don't even come with 10 gigabit ethernet. Now the Jellyfish is easier to set up and connect to initially compared to the QNAP, which is nice if you don't wanna spend time setting up, but for me, when I looked at the price tags and I saw a $14,000 difference, I was sold. This price tag also includes what is, in my opinion, the best hard drives on the market, their 14 terabytes even, as well as the best SSDs on the market. So if you have a lower budget, you could actually get the price tag quite a bit lower and still have great speeds and multi-user editing capability. I spent over six months with this QNAP and have over five pages of notes and test results, but I'm gonna make this video as short as possible while giving you a ton of great info on the device, drives, speeds, SSD caching, backup, and some other things to look out for. And I guarantee that this will be one of the best, if not the best videos on using the QNAP for video editing. Before this unit, we were using a four bay, which is a great entry level option that's really capable for its price tag. But after about a year and a half, we kept filling it up and I also wanted to add a third editor. So I wanted some extra speed in case I'm working on large raw files while they are editing as well. I'll leave a link to my long-term review for that device, but this time around, I wanted to have something that's a bit overkill. So I don't even have to think about storage for years to come. Using a shared storage server has been so amazing for my team. In the past, we would have a bunch of hard drives that we would hand around and have to wait for stuff to copy over before resuming and it was a huge waste of productivity. Now everything is stored on the NAS. Photos, videos, projects, scratch files, everything. And we edit off of it directly with perfectly smooth results no matter if one of us is editing and others are transferring data onto the device or off of it or even if all three of us are editing at the same time while we're moving files around as well. Not only that, but we don't have to worry about running out of space. And if a hard drive dies, we don't lose any data. And in the event of a power outage, the QNAP actually talks to our backup UPS. And if the power doesn't go back on for 10 minutes, or if the battery is low, it will actually disconnect the drives from the QNAP and shut itself down to not risk any data corruption. That is awesome. Let's start talking about the hardware. You may have seen a few QNAP videos on my channel before. I had a 12 bay and then a four bay. Both are great devices and this one falls right in the middle. This new line can actually be bought in either a four bay, a six bay, or a eight bay. And I think for most small teams, the six bay is a great middle ground, but I decided to go for the eight bay since it's not that much more money and gives you the greatest capacity and drive speed. The unit itself looks nice and is fairly professional. The drive bays have quick release plates and are really easy to install. And on the inside, there are two slots for NVMe SSD storage. On the front, there's a display to give you info. And on the inside, there's actually a speaker uh, that will beep at you for certain things. There's also a power and copy button at the front here. And there's also a USB port, which is the fastest ports that are available on the market for connecting external devices. The copy button could be set up to do a bunch of tasks like automatically transferring everything from the connected device or just copying over what's not already been transferred in the past if you leave data on your cards or even backing up specific folders of the NAS to the connected drive. On the back, there are four more USB ports, both standard and USB that could be used for a bunch of tasks. There's two gigabit ethernet ports for connecting the QNAP directly to the internet and also connecting computers or switches. There's two Thunderbolt 3 ports and a 10 gigabit ethernet for ultra fast video editing. There's also an expansion slot so you can add in up to two more 10 gigabit ethernet ports to have up to five video editors connected without a need for expensive or difficult network switches. You can also add a bunch of other PCI cards like SSDs or even a graphics card. We also 
also have an HDMI port for connecting a display if you want to run it as a media server or to access the OS without connecting a different computer. Since this isn't just a video editing server, you could do a crazy amount of things with it, like running a ton of apps, websites, Plex, surveillance, and even your own personal cloud, and a bunch more. Like I mentioned, it could even support a graphics card if you want to run full CPU and GPU intensive apps like video streaming or virtual machines, but that won't help for video editing because you can't use it as an eGPU. The system can, however, convert your video files if you want lower res versions without needing to use your own computer. Now, personally, I don't use most of these things since I mainly need fast and reliable video editing storage, but the capabilities are immense and the system has one of the latest 6 core Intel processors and 16 gigabytes of RAM so it's very capable. I'll leave a link in the video description to my other video where I talk about all the apps and different capabilities it could do. But the main things I use it for are the cloud capability to be able to access all of my data from anywhere in the world either using the web login or the mobile app. I can also monitor everything and get automatic notifications if something is off. I can download any file that I want and even stream video from my QNAP app just like if it was on YouTube. I can also send a link to anybody so they can download any file just like you would with Google Drive or say Dropbox and I can also set an expiration date or even a password. This is very helpful if I have a bunch of video that I shot and I need to send it to an editor or a different team or maybe whoever hired me and I don't have to first upload it to the cloud before they can download it. They can just download it directly from the device and that saves a bunch of time. On the back we have three fans, two for the unit and another one for the power supply and then two more internally for the CPU and other components. I think the biggest complaint for me personally is the power supply fan can be a bit loud and you actually can't set it to quiet mode like you can with the other fans. If I had this beast on my desk it would get annoying next to our mostly silent Max but we actually keep it under our desk and the sound does blend into our central air system. Uh, if you use 10 gigabit ethernet, you can actually move the NAS further away from you or even store it in like a closet or another room like many people do with standard servers, which are crazy loud compared to this system. But if you use Thunderbolt 3, the farthest that you can get it away from you is about six feet because that's the longest cables that are currently available. If you need something that is really quiet, um, I would suggest the four bay version. That thing is basically silent other than the hard drive clicks since it uses an external power brick. Even with the eight drives running, at 100% utilization for 15 hours and the fans set to the lowest possible, the 6 core processor was only at 39 degrees Celsius and the system at 28 degrees Celsius and the drives were ranging from between 39 to 40 Celsius. That's a fair bit cooler than my previous 4 bay and very cool in general so this QNAP will have no issues treating the Seagate hard drives very well. Those temps were during the 15 hour initial setup where the QNAP completely verifies and initiates initializes all of the drives and sets up your RAID. That will also tell you if there are any issues with your hard drives before you start using them. Waiting for that initial setup can be annoying, but ultimately it's much better than having a quick initial setup and then a few weeks later having a hard drive die on you because you figure out that it was faulty. In general, the QNAP's operating system has a ton of tools and scans that could be set up to automatically run tests on the system, including a specific one that is designed for the Iron Wolf drives that I'm using and it'll actually allow it to get more information on the drives compared to standard smart testing. I have my system set to test once a week on Sunday nights when I'm not at work and also to verify my data to make sure that everything is safe. This is very useful to help catch any faulty drives before a hard drive crashes. Setting up is fairly easy if you've done one before, but if you're new you'll definitely want to be patient and read the info on each step. I opted for RAID 5 since I wanted to maximize my speed and capacity and since I'm using the best drives available on the market and I also create external backups. This means that I can have one hard drive completely fail and none of my data is lost. Just a reminder that even though this solution is redundant and much better than regular hard drive or SSD, you should also have backups of anything that you can't afford to lose with preferably one in another location in case of fire, theft, or anything else. Those of you that are extra sensitive to data loss can set up in another RAID volume like RAID 6 which will allow up to two drives to completely fail without any data loss. Before I give you guys the interesting data on the speeds with different configurations and devices, let's cover why I went 
it with these hard drives, the Seagate Iron Wolf Pros. First and foremost, I wanted to have the ultimate reliability, and these are rated for running 24-7, 365, with a workload of 300 terabytes per year, and a mean time failure rate of 1.2 million hours, which is crazy. Not only are they really well rated and have special sensors and optimization for NAS usage, but they are also backed up by a five year warranty instead of one or two years. And also, if a hard drive dies, they actually have rescue service which can recover your data, included I think for two years with these drives, which can get crazy expensive if you've ever actually looked into how much this type of service costs. The other part is performance. Many viewers actually didn't believe the total speeds in my other video that was covering the 12 bay QNAP because hard drives are usually not that fast, but these Iron Wolf Pros at 12 terabytes or above run at 250 megabytes per second. That's compared to about 150 to 180 of most drives. They also run at 7,200 RPM instead of most NAS drives which run at 5,400 RPM which improves seek times. If you're on a lower budget, they also have lower capacities and are still very fast compared to regular hard drives. I'll go ahead and link those down in the video description. Now let's jump in and talk about the speeds that I get from this beast, and then I'll tell you guys about a few quirks and my overall editing experience. The maximum speeds that you will get depend on a lot of different things, but even in the worst case scenario, a setup like this will give you a thousand megabytes per second read and a thousand megabytes per second write for a single computer over 10 gigabit ethernet. But that limitation is actually not the unit itself, it's the 10 gigabit ethernet. <laughs> that speed is actually enough to run three to four streams of full quality, highest bit rate, red 8K raw video, or if you shoot with Sony 4K footage, up to 80 streams of 4K footage. But of course, the limitation will actually be your CPU, which probably can't handle that. So even in the worst case scenario, where we're going over 10 gigabit ethernet, this thing is more than fast enough for pretty much every scenario. Now, if you connect, say, a 5K iMac over Thunderbolt 3, we got 1,550 megabytes per second read and 1,250 megabytes per second write. So that's even better. The Thunderbolt speeds can really vary based on how fast your Thunderbolt is, what kind of controller it has, and other things like what year your computer is. Our 2018 MacBook Pro was a little bit slower at 1350 megabytes read and 1200 write when connected by itself compared to the iMac, and our 2016 MacBook Pro is actually a little bit slower than that, but the speeds are still really incredible and faster than standard external SSDs that many of us use, like the Samsung T5. For the numbers that I'm gonna go over using 10 gigabit ethernet, I use my 2016 MacBook Pro using the QNAP Thunderbolt 3 to 10 gigabit ethernet adapter, which uses the same exact Aquantia chip that's inside of the iMac Pro. This thing is powered by the same cable that it connects to, which is really convenient, but there is a small internal fan which can spin up at times and be a little bit louder than I would like. Now these speeds are without SSD caching and using each device on its own. When you start to have two or more machines max out the connections uh, at the same exact time, the RAID does have to get split and then minus some bottlenecking. With two Macs trying to pull as much data as possible, our maximum read is actually lower than write for some reason, but still fast enough for three streams of Canon C200 4K RAW on both systems at the same time. Connecting our third PC over 10 gigabit ethernet, we are now populating all of the fast connections that come standard with this QNAP, and then our total speed actually goes up a bit to 1,600 megabytes per second write, and it gets about 1,200 megabytes per second read. For most people, that kind of speed is more than fast enough, even for three editors at the same time. Even if you're using the best codecs available in hybrid cameras that have top-notch compression, like say the 400 megabit per second Alli in the GH5, or the 400 megabit per second in the Fuji X-T3. Each video editor in that case could pull eight streams of high quality 4K footage, and that's not eight streams total, that's eight streams of 4K per machine, so 24 streams total. But at that point, you better have some pretty powerful computers if you actually wanna be able to handle that. Keep in mind, that's also if every single computer is attempting to max out its connection at the same exact time. 
But in the real world, that would rarely happen, and the speeds are actually higher. If Vadim and Angelica are editing our normal Sony 4K project, I can actually transfer a project from our server to my MacBook Pro to be able to edit it on the go at 1,200 megabytes a second, and I can also offload footage from my fastest external SSD that I have, which is the Samsung Extreme at 800 megabytes per second. Um, so that's the limitation of that hard drive. All while both editors are perfectly having smooth playback and editing their footage without any hiccups at all. But as I said, I wanted this to be a bit overkill so that I don't have to even think about thinking about storage for many years to come. So I decided to add a few SSDs to enable SSD caching. What this means is as you're actually starting to use your files, they get copied over to the SSD and they stay on there. And that increases your speed. And along with that, there's other benefits like putting less wear on the hard drives. And then if there's any background tasks going on, say you have to rebuild a hard drive or something else, you're not affected at all because you're editing off of the SSD. Now I did a ton of testing with a single SSD, dual SSDs, both in RAID 0 and RAID 1, with one computers and then two computers and and having three computers connected at once, and I even added a 4X NVMe SSD to the expansion slot at the back to try to figure out what's the best bang for the buck if you're gonna use SSD caching for this unit. Uh, but if I go over all of those numbers, that's gonna add probably an additional 15 minutes to this video, and as you can tell, it's already long. So I'm just gonna give you guys the best results and also my recommendation and what I ended up using long-term. The two NVMe SSD slots inside of the QNAP run at 2X PCI lanes, meaning that the maximum they can run at is 1,667 megabytes each. That means that even if you buy the best Samsung Pro SSD that I did, which goes up to 3,500 megabytes per second, um, it's actually limiting the SSD, the QNAP does, which is a bummer. Now that doesn't mean that you should go buy, you know, the cheapest SSD that's out there, uh, because a little secret that a lot of people don't know is that most SSDs on the market will give you the maximum speeds only if they're not filled up, and then only if you're not pushing a bunch of data all at once, and if you do either of one of those things, it can actually get significantly slower. And another thing to note is that SSDs are also rated on their lifespan, with cheaper ones not being rated at all. The ones that I'm using are rated for 640 gigabytes of data transfers every day for five years, which is like really, really high. Uh, but the SSD that I would recommend for most of you guys is the 970 EVO Plus. That one can handle 320 gigabytes a day for five years, which is still a lot and more than enough for pretty much everybody. My expensive 970 Pro doesn't slow down when it's full, but the 970 EVO Plus does slow down like most SSDs do to a 1,700 megabytes per second, um, that's still faster than what the QNAP allows. So even when it slows down, you won't notice it at all. Most other SSDs, uh, like the non-plus 970 EVO version, that will slow down to 1200, and a lot of them will slow down up to, you know, all the way down to 400 megabytes per second, and at that point, it's not even worth having SSD caching, so be sure to buy the one that I recommend for the best results, or the 970 Pro if you just wanna throw away more money. The QNAP allows you to use a bunch of different setups. You can do read-only for the cache, which is very safe, since if one of the SSDs SSD dies or if it gets corrupted, your data is still on all of the hard drives. So everything's just kind of like a duplicate. And then when you're editing off of the SSDs, it speeds up your read speeds, but then your write speeds, when you're writing to it, um, that's still the same. It doesn't get changed because it's still using the hard drives when you're writing. Now there is an option called read and write and that will give you the best speeds because you're actually working off of the SSD and uh, just using any regular SSD for the read and write will actually bring you up to 1,700 read and 1,700 megabytes per second write. That's with three computers and that makes total sense because that's pretty much the limitation of the slot in here. Now, if you have two of these SSDs in RAID 0, the speed goes up to a massive 3,100 megabytes a second, and then the write goes up to 2,750. Those are some incredible speeds, and then basically each editor gets over 1,000 megabytes a second all at the same time, which is 
crazy. Uh, but if you set it up this way, there is some risk of losing data if one of these hard drives or one of these SSDs fails. So the QNAP, because of this, will actually require you to enter your password uh, if you wanna set it up this way. You can also run the SSDs in RAID 1, which means that if one of them dies, you won't lose any data. But the speeds are a bit lower at 2,700 megabytes per second read and 2,000 megabytes write, which is still fantastic. The only downside to this setup really, which is the reason why I'm not using it, is if you're using the setup, it actually duplicates the files, so there's a double copy of everything. So say if you have two 512 gig SSDs in RAID 1, you only get 512 gigabytes of capacity. So if you're like me and you work on large projects, say four to 800 gigabytes, like for the weddings we do, you wanna make sure you at least get two one terabyte SSDs if you're gonna run them in this fashion. The other option that is reliable is called read-only cache meaning your write speeds won't change, but also that you can run two SSDs in RAID 0 for maximum capacity while not risking losing any data, as well as having the maximum speed. So as you can see, I got a shocking 3,200 megabytes a second read, and then my write speed is 1,300 megabytes per second, um, since we're not actually using the SSDs when we're writing. This may seem a bit disappointing when you saw the other higher speeds previously and the other versions of RAID, but in all reality, when you're video editing, you're almost always just reading, not writing. And then when you are writing, you typically need less than 100 megabytes per second per computer. So at 1300, we have more than enough write speeds. We've been running the setup for the last six months and it's been working amazing for us. I do wanna also mention that if you're a single user or you're a team of let's say two people or even three people, you most likely do not need these kinds of speeds. Uh, unless maybe you're editing, you know, multi-stream 8K Red Raw and you each want to have three streams of that running if you have some crazy, you know, 18 core computer. <laughs> uh, but in reality, for most people, if you want to save some extra money, you don't even need to do SSD caching. Um, unless you want the extra speeds for a little bit more money, in that case, I would suggest it. <laughs> That was a lot of data, and if you cared for all that data, please make sure to hit that like button. I try to condense like three pages worth and skip out a bunch of stuff most people probably don't need to. So now let's briefly touch on cables for just a second. If you're gonna use 10 gigabit ethernet, CAT6 is more than fast enough, but personally, if you're buying cables, I would suggest CAT7, as they cost about the same price. Now for Thunderbolt 3 cables, I would suggest the 40 gigabit per second powered cables for the best speeds. If you go with unpowered or 20 gigabit per second speeds, you'll actually get you know, maybe 50% of the bandwidth, and that will slow you down. And overall, the price difference is about $20 to $30 per cable, so I would highly suggest getting the better ones, and I'll leave a link to the ones that we're using down in the video description. As far as cable lengths, I tested out six feet, three feet, and one and a half feet, and I figured out that as long as you're using powered cables, the speeds are practically the same. For the tests and speeds that I showed you guys previously, I was using powered cables that are six feet long, since I think that's what most people will end up using. So what about the quirks? Well, every once in a while, I could get a disconnection randomly, and that will just uh, kind of force my Final Cut to kind of disconnect. It's not that often. At this point with the latest firmware, it might be once or twice a month, uh, but it's not really hard to fix that. You basically unplug the cable and then plug it back in. And then if you're using 10 gigabit Ethernet, you don't even have to do that. You just go to the QFinder app and hit connect. Another quirk is that if you're used to using the Mac Spotlight to search, it doesn't really work well to find files on the server, but that's not a problem with the QNAP, that's actually a problem with Spotlight Search in general, and you get the same result using any server. Using Thunderbolt 3 to connect is incredibly easy, um, not as easy as using a direct attached drive where you just plug in and it shows up, but as long as you have QFinder open, uh, which it defaults to staying open once you install it, when you plug in one of the Thunderbolt cables, you'll actually get this little pop-up by default, and then it will ask you, uh, for the password and all of that stuff can be saved after the initial setup. So all you do is hit connect and uh, once you have the setup the first time, it probably takes about 10 to 15 seconds to connect to the server when you plug in your computer. One thing that the QNAP offers is internet over Thunderbolt and personally I would suggest against using that. It can be useful if you have a computer that doesn't have Wi-Fi or you don't wanna use Wi-Fi um, or you don't have ethernet and it'll actually pass through internet to your computer but that will actually 
really slow down your connection to the server because it has to share that one cable. So I would just advise against that and just setting it so it doesn't even pop up. The last thing that I wanna cover are backups. There are a ton of options with this QNAP. You can back up directly or even remotely through the internet to another QNAP device. And you can even back up to a bunch of different cloud services, including Amazon AWS and a bunch more. Personally, I connect an eight terabyte external hard drive and I have it automatically back up my most important folders to it nightly. And then I could take the hard drive and I could take it home and the next morning bring another one there. And that way I have an offsite backup just in case of you know fire or theft. And I just flip back and forth that way. So it makes it very easy, very simple. And it's mostly automatic as long as I don't forget to take it home. And then in the worst case scenario, if something does happen, I only lose one day of productivity Whatever backup solution you use, this thing probably can support it. And I do wanna say once again, make sure you have backup other than this device because so many things can happen. And this is mainly redundancy at your office. Overall, this thing is a godsend for small teams. It allows us to have a ton of storage with very, very fast speeds, has amazing web apps, it has redundancy, it has a ton of connectivity. You can actually connect a bunch of stuff to it and all for a very reasonable price. Let me do that comparison again that I did at the beginning of the video. This thing is faster than the $20,000 Jellyfish and it has faster speeds if you're using SSD caching and without it, they're probably very similar. And on top of that, it has two Thunderbolt 3 ports, which no other brand offers. So that just brings it to be an amazing value. Uh, it also has 10 gigabit ethernet, just like the Jellyfish. And for a few hundred dollars, you can add two more of those. So that makes it really capable if you wanna move this thing into a different area and not have it close to you. Or if you just wanna hook up five people directly without needing a network switch in those 10 gigabit ethernet switches are pricey and they're fairly difficult to set up. So overall, I guess I could just say that I would highly, highly recommend this QNAP. Let me know if you guys have any questions you guys can ask down in the comment section below. Um, I had a bunch of other things that I could have mentioned, but I just wanted to keep this video from being probably 40 to 50 minutes long. So if you have a question, I'll do my best to answer those. Once again, I have links to everything down in the description uh, be before, below the video. <laughs> I'm so tired of recording this video now. So if you guys made it this far, uh, you appreciate all of the testing, which is, I don't know, days and days of testing, and then you know a couple more days to make this video please hit that like button. And if you buy through those links, that helps support the channel. It helps me to be able to make more videos like these, which not a lot of people are willing to make videos for storage and especially, you know, make them as detailed as the one you guys have seen here. Thank you guys for watching. This has been Max and I will see you guys in the next video.